Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for another lesson. This time we're talking about eigenvectors, and the context we're studying is coupled oscillators. So I want to start with the idea of a couple of masses, uh, each equal mass, connected together by springs. And I want you to imagine that we have two big springs and a small spring. The two big springs are connected uh, to the walls, which the walls are stationary, and the small spring is connected between the two masses. The idea is that the spring constant for the small spring is small, and the constant for the big springs are big. So um, the equilibrium positions of the two masses are located uh, in this picture at their centers, and then the idea is these masses are going to stretch a little bit, and so we denote the displacement of these masses from their equilibrium position as x1 and x2. Now the force on mass 1 is going to be related to x1 and x2, and the force on, X, on mass 2 is going to be related to x1 and x2, like so. And uh, the other thing I want to point out is that the, we're going to think of the displacements as components of a vector, a vector that shows the displacement as a function of time. But we're looking for normal modes, so the displacements have to have a constant relationship with each other, uh, multiplied by some phasor. And the idea is that the real displacement is going to be the real part of this overall phasor. And uh, that means the acceleration has to be minus omega squared times the phasor back again. If we keep track of all that and we put in Newton's second law, the mass times the acceleration is the net force, you'll notice we can write the net force as a matrix multiplied by this original vector multiplied by the phasor. And uh, if we put back in what the acceleration is, you'll see right away we get this matrix equation. And the e to the i omega t just sort of goes along for the ride. So we can dispense with the e to the i omega t and just demand that the magnitudes on both sides match. And so we get a matrix equation like this. This is a uh, very important problem. In, uh, in general, it's called the eigenvalue problem. A matrix multiplied by an unknown vector is equal to a number multiplied by the same unknown vector. It turns out there are only certain vectors for which that can be satisfied. In the case of a two by two matrix, there are only two vectors that satisfy this relationship, and they are called the eigenvectors of the matrix. And the value that you get for omega squared when you put in an eigenvector is called the eigenvalue of the matrix, of the, of the vector. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, let's see if we can solve this problem. What I want to do is multiply the vector on the right by the identity, factor in the omega squared, and then subtract from both sides. And I want you to look at that problem. I've got a matrix times a vector equals a zero. So in general, if I have a matrix times a vector equal to a known vector, I can solve that by taking the inverse of the matrix, multiplying on both sides, and I get the vector is equal to the inverse of the matrix times the known vector. So the unknown vector is the inverse of the matrix times the known vector. And so if you put in what a, the inverse is, it's the so-called cofactor matrix or whatever, divided by the determinant of the original matrix. And uh, the problem is, if you try that approach in this problem, if you uh, calculate the inverse of this matrix and multiply it by the right-hand side, you're definitely going to get zero because the right-hand side is zero. The only way you won't get zero is if the determinant of that matrix is also zero. And that means that you have a way to find out the eigenvalues. You just demand that the determinant of the matrix be zero, and you solve for the eigenvalues. And what you get in this case is that there are two eigenvalues. Uh, if you take the plus sign from the square root, you get kb plus 2 ks over m. If you take the minus sign from the square root, you get kb over m. And uh, it turns out those two correspond to the uh, low frequency and the high frequency eigen or modes of vibration uh, we saw from last time. So uh, let's go ahead and put in the first root and see what we get. If we put in omega squared as kb over m, then we get that um, ks over m times x1 is equal to ks over m times x2. And the only way that can be true is if x1 is equal to x2. So uh, it turns out if you use omega squared as kb over m, 
then the mode that goes with that is the mode where x1 and x2 track together. So that's one mode of vibration. The other mode is when omega squared is kb plus 2ks over m. If we put that in for omega squared and then we fiddle around, <coughs> we find that the, uh, the kb over m's cancel and we end up with uh, ks over m times x1 is minus ks over m times x2 and that means x1 is minus x2. So that's the other mode of vibration. So we have one mode where the two masses track together and the other mode where the masses track in the opposite direction. Let's look at that in a demo. Okay guys, so here's the uh, notebook I've uploaded to our web server and I want to point out that it's uh, it's got two different modes, I guess. Um, if you want to use vPython to visualize the motion of these guys, you want to set use visual to true. So let me do that here real quick. Uh, one of the side effects of using visual, unfortunately, is that once you enter into the time loop, so here we have a while true, that loop runs forever, and as a result, uh, the notebook won't execute beyond that cell. So it's great for visualizing, but if you want to continue executing, uh, you will need to set use visual to false and start from scratch, restart the kernel probably, restart the kernel, and um, and then run all again with use visual set to false. It will skip the visual import, it will skip the visual um, endless loop here and jump down and use the PyLab version to make these plots and to calculate the eigenvectors and so on, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, I just wanted to point that out. So use visual equals true, we'll use vPython, use visual equal false, we'll use PyLab. So let's set it equal to true and let's run the whole thing, run all, and uh, you'll notice that we have a nice visual uh, script here, there we go, that's showing, this is the low frequency mode of vibration of these two guys. Notice that the displacement from equilibrium is the same for both masses. So that's what you would expect. Let's go ahead, and uh, I also want to point out that once you uh, run visual and hit that loop, the, it will kill the kernel when you close that window. So you want to, um, you're going to have to run all from the beginning again. You can't uh, just start from that one cell. So I'll show you how that works here in a second. Um, let's come down to where we actually run the thing. Uh, where do we set up the initial conditions here? Hmm. Oh, I know. It's up here somewhere. There it is. Okay. We set the initial conditions in this cell that the same cell is executed by both the vPython and the PyLab versions. I just couldn't find it for a second. So here they are, the initial conditions. Here we started x1 out at L over 10 and x2 out at L over 10, and that put us in the low frequency mode. Now what I want to do is to set the initial conditions to put x1 at plus L over 10 and x2 at minus L over 10, that's going to be now purely in the high frequency mode. And if I run all again, then you'll notice we've got the same idea. It's just now the two masses have opposite displacements and you can see this is a higher frequency mode of vibration, just like we worked out in the slides before. So that is not surprising. Now um, let's go back one more time and set the initial conditions so that x1 is L over 10 and x2 starts out at 0. So I'm going to type a 0 here and comment out the rest of that line. That means that uh, we're not in the low frequency mode and we're not in the high frequency mode, but in fact we're in a superposition of the two modes. Because x1 is positive in both modes and x2 is positive in one and negative in the other, when you add the two together in equal amounts, x1 ends up being uh, non-zero, but x2 is zero because it gets a plus one from the low frequency mode and a minus one from the high frequency mode. So another way to think about that is if you start the thing out with x2 equal to zero and x1 non-zero, what you're really doing is starting the thing out in a superposition of the two modes with equal amplitudes of, of the two modes of vibration. So let's see what that looks like. All right, there you go. Notice what's happening. Um, X1 started out with a big 
amplitude and x2 was zero, and then uh, at, the energy appeared to transfer over to the other mass, and then it just transfers back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like that. And that is just fascinating. You could just sit and watch that all day long. But um, that is the typical behavior in a coupled system where energy gets transferred back and forth between the masses in the system. So, and we're going to learn more about this in the next in next week's project. Next week's project, we're going to be dealing with uh, getting more in depth with regard to phasers and analytical solutions. Um, this week, I just want you to get used to the idea of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Next week, we're going to dig in a little deeper in terms of vector spaces and how all that works. But, uh, but that's the idea. Okay, so now I'm going to go up to the top and set use visual equal to false. And, uh, <coughs> and then we'll run it again. We'll start the cell, say run all, and uh, it'll come down and run the whole thing. Let's see where we are. Okay, there we go. Um, notice uh, I bumped up the time a little bit on the uh, graph. So you can now see that at the beginning, x1 is big, x2 is small, and they transition back and forth. So it's a handy, this graphical means. It's not quite as visual as the vPython, but you do get a definite uh, idea of what's going on. I also wanted to point out that there, I've repeated some of the math from the slides down here, and I wanted to show you that uh, Python, the, the scipy eig function, or pylab eig function, can, uh, can find eigenvalues and eigenvectors pretty easily. You just put the matrix in as an array, and you call eig, and out come the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So here are the eigenvalues, 12 and 10, and the corresponding eigenvectors, uh, 1 over the square root of 2, and minus 1 over the square root of 2, and plus 1 over the square root of 2, and 1 over the square root of 2. I should point out that eig normalizes the eigenvectors so that the sum of the squares of the components of the eigenvectors is 1. So they're orthonormal, typically, from the matrices we'll be dealing with. They're orthonormal vectors. And uh, all I want to point out at the end is that I would like you guys, as Project 10, it's an easy project, I think, so I want you to go through the math of figuring out the matrix for three masses on springs. Equal, take three equal masses connected to four equal spring constant springs. So just let the spring constant be k and uh, for all the springs. Find the eigenvectors, find the eigenvalues, then pick one of the eigenvectors, in other words, one of the modes of vibration, set the thing up to have the initial conditions that correspond to that eigenvector, and then run the Runge-Kutta simulation just like I did here. So you can basically use the RK4 to integrate the motion for those three masses on springs, and then graph it for the three masses. You could just maybe do one mass, actually. Um, and you should see a steady frequency, and the frequency should be the eigenvalue for that mode, whichever mode you chose to simulate. And that will be confirmation that you've done the calculation correctly, because you simulated it, and it does really wiggle with that frequency. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We'll talk to you soon.